First off, I'd like to let you know it's taboo to speak of them, or the others as it brings them after you. That said, here's my story. It was 25 years ago. I lived on the reservation with my family, and I was out with some friends. We went down to the creek to have a day of reed picking, and we were enjoying listening to the sounds of nature. I couldn't resist trying to catch a little frog I saw. I reached out to catch it, and it hopped away. Well, as I was expecting that, I started back a bit, and I fell forward and landed against a small boulder and sprained my ankle. I tried to get up, and I couldn't because my foot had swelled up really bad. I couldn't even take off my shoe or sock at this point. My friends came over to sit with me and figure out how we were going to get back to the adobe. There were seven of us, and we were all too scared to walk back alone due to our parents always telling us never to leave each other at all costs. We were trying to think what to do when we were at a loss. We went silent for a while, and that's when we all noticed that the animals around us were quiet as well. We all thought nothing of it, and continued to think about the life and how we were going to get back to the adobe. I was apologizing for the hundredth time when we heard a noise. I jumped and screamed out in pain. My friend, she grabbed my arm and told me to put my weight on her shoulders, and then another friend joined her. I'm between two of my friends lipping along the pathway when we hear another noise, kind of like a fire popping noise, and yet no fire around for half a mile. Well, we stopped and we listened and then a smell so bad and nauseating overcame us. I'm not even sure how to say how it smelled. It was kind of dead and rotted like a fresh metallic smell mixed in with a little bit of garbage. What I'd say, this was definitely puzzling, as it wasn't no Bigfoot or anything like that. It was no wildlife we knew that smelled like that either. We were scared, and honestly, really freaked out. We decided my friend Scotty was going to investigate and find out what was causing the smell. We were fixating and arguing with him because we didn't want him to go. The smell became so strong, we all vomited, we couldn't breathe without an overwhelming disgusting nauseous feeling overwhelming us. You may think I'm nuts, and at this point I wouldn't blame you for I'm telling you this right now. This is the God's honest truth. When I was able to stop the nausea and vomiting, I looked up from between my friend's shoulders and saw the most horrifying thing I have ever seen in my life. Right on a hill in front of us, about a yard and a half away, stood a skimwalker. He was starting towards us and making hardly any sound at all. We'd been warned about them and we knew we were going to have to get away from here. I decided pain or not I was going to just suck it up and run as best as I could. I wasn't going to let my friends go down because of me. I let go of their shoulders. I took a deep breath and I started to run as fast as I could. I really don't know how or why, but I was too focused on the running from him, but I barely felt my ankle at this point. We were all at a dead run down the path across the fields and finally reached the adobe. We all ran in, gasping for breath and my mom and my friend's moms looked at us asking what had happened to us. We were so freaked out and running, as the hounds had been after us. Well, Sarah caught her breath first and started to ramble on about what had happened. I started calming down and collapsed and cringed from my sprained ankle. My mom came over with Mary Ann, my cousin's sister-in-law, and both started to work on my ankle. I got chided for being clumsy and trying to mess with wildlife. I was so badly in pain I wanted to scream. I asked if I could have some water, and my mom gave me a little bit. She told me to drink slowly if they get sick if I drink too fast. My sister and brothers came in, and we were told to go get healing herbs from the shaman. I was passing in and out of awareness, and I could barely hear bits and pieces of my friends telling their stories about our ordeal. I must have passed out since when I woke up I was in my bed and my mom was sitting in a corner, churning bread to cook for dinner. She immediately came to my bedside and said the shaman had been here to see me, and he said I'll be fine. We all should be okay. He didn't think we were affected by the bad spirit, but we need to follow orders in order to stay safe from now, as he thinks it may be a warning to us. I still wonder to this day 
who he was and why he was warning us and about what. I will never know, but I since then have moved and grown up, but I never have and never will mess with wildlife for any reason unless it's to save a life. I'll just watch it from a distance and enjoy its beauty. I'm not in any hurry to be punished by the evil spirit for doing evil things. I prefer to be an okay person and to just worship our great spirit, our creator. You may not believe me, but I will tell you this one. Don't speak about them, and don't let them possess you or kill you. I live in the Pacific Northwest and I've always been an outdoors kind of guy. I love to camp and hike and spend most of my time outside. Now, I'm not oblivious. I know to take precautions such as carrying a knife and letting someone know where I'm going. Usually, I'll go with my Bernese mountain dog, but on this occasion, I was with friends. I heard of Wendigos and all of that before, but I had not ever seen anything out of the ordinary, so I assumed they were just that. Stories. Me and my friends would joke about it sometimes. The Wendigo is going to get to you. But I never talked about it when going into the woods. My friends and I decided to go on a trip deep in the woods. I don't like to go to campgrounds, so that way we can really be out there. For the sake of names, it was me, my friend Anthony and Victor. Nothing out of the ordinary occurred. Although, as we drove as far as we could into the woods and hiked onto the trail for about another two miles. As we hiked, I sensed something was off. I shook the feeling off as maybe an animal was around. I'm sometimes sensitive to energies. As we settled at our campground, Victor and I were taking pictures of the scenery, and Anthony, of course, was helping himself to his 12-pack of beer. I know alcoholic or not. Nah. Anyways, as the night carried on, Anthony began ranting about some girl who broke his heart and getting all into his feelings, and I tried to change the subject by telling some scary camping stories. In the middle of a story we heard some branches crack nearby, and I got silent. I do this to see if it's an animal like a bear. Victor then said, maybe we should try to make some noises to scare it off. And Anthony, six beards in, begins loudly saying, Braille, it's probably the Wendigo. Hey Wendigo, come get me, drink bitch. I reply, Anthony, are you one of those guys that just does stupid shit like this? Come down, dude, we're probably on native land at this point. The national forest we were on was a borderline of a reservation. Anthony said, that he's gonna fuck shit up if he saw it, and talking nonsense like that. Fast forward, me and Anthony are just by the fire, while Victor was in the tent getting ready to go to sleep. As me and Anthony talk about his ex-girlfriend problems, he tells me he has to take a piss. So I go with him to make sure he doesn't fall or something. He had too many shots to even walk right. And as I'm waiting for him to finish, I hear Victor's voice. But it sounded different. Anthony! Help me. It repeats this two more times, the exact same tone as if it was robotic. At this moment, I knew it was either Victor or something else. Again, I am aware of native folklore, and I know not to risk answering to whatever was calling us. I tell Anthony, did you hear that? Anthony asked me, what? Nothing. I, I, I'll hut or no. I wait a few more seconds, and nothing happens. Now, I took this as me being paranoid. I did smoke a little bit of weed, so maybe I was just psyching myself out. When we got back, Victor was outside by the fire telling us he can't sleep. Now keep in mind, we are in a field of grass by the tree line. I thought it was a cool spot to see the stars at night. As we talked, I saw something in the corner of my eye. And dear... I remember seeing one before finding the clearing and thought maybe it was the same one as before. Guess we had a friend following us. Well, I soon found out it was no friend. My friends saw me looking at the deer doing his thing in the field eating grass. Me looking back at my friends, 
Guess we have a visitor. Victor said, a Wendigo, laughing. And of course Anthony says, I swear if that's one I'm killing this. And he starts screaming at it again. Anthony, leave the freaking deer alone. At this point, we aren't paying attention to the deer and are just talking face to face by the fire. When I glanced back and the deer was gone. Like not gone from the spot, but vanished. At the time, I didn't think much of it. But then, Anthony gets up and shouts, Wendy go! And as soon as he says it, I see the deer peeking behind a tree. As I make eye contact with it, it opens its mouth and speaks. It said, in the most inhuman, distorted voice I had ever heard, And is hey, how, how me? I, I froze. I couldn't believe what I had just seen. My friends noticed this and turned round and faced the deer, which was standing on two legs and about eight feet tall. Its mouth opened more, revealing sharp teeth, and it screams in this maniacal laughter. We took off in through the woods, not even caring about our campsites. Thankfully, we were right by the trail that we took to get there, and as I'm running faster than I ever have before, I turn to see that this thing is following us, saying, in a demonic voice, we split up to make this thing lose us somehow, and by some stroke of luck I found somewhere to hide under a huge fallen tree and crawled into it with Victor. As we sit there staying quiet as we possibly can, we hear heavy footsteps and heavy breathing. Then luckily, it continued on. After what felt like an eternity, we got out and desperately hoped that Anthony was still around. We decided to head to the truck and thank God Anthony was there, locked inside us. We got in and got the hell out of there, but before we took off we heard the most haunting scream that echoed across the room. Safe to say, I'm never taking him camping again, and I don't think he wants to go after that experience. It was around 11 p.m. at night. We wanted to visit a graveyard, so we ended up going to Double Butte Cemetery near South Mountain in Phoenix. As we were pulling in, a coyote dashed across the car and ran toward the mountains. It looked weird, like one of those overbred, incest German shepherds that are all short and hunched over. But I didn't think too much of it. We parked and walked away from the car and explored the graveyard. There were no sign of people or coyotes, but whenever we walked near a bush or a tree, we heard rustling. But we figured it was just some sort of rodent or bat. When we were done, we walked toward the car to leave, but we saw a cool little gated sanctuary garden type thing. So we went in there and sat for a little. All of a sudden, we heard what sounded like a weird mix of a laugh, scream, and a howl. I was confused to what this humanist scream was at first, so my mind immediately translated it to multiple coyotes, a pack. We were about to leave, and then we saw four sets of glowing eyes crouching and coming toward us. Fast. I still figured an angry coyote pack, so we ran to the car. After being safe in the car, we got a little more ballsy and tried to find them. They were nowhere to be seen. I saw three, maybe four shadows of human figures on the other side of the graveyard from the car. I thought to myself, wow, there are people here this late. I wonder why we didn't see or hear that. It's a pretty small, flat and treeless graveyard. Basically, just dirt and deserts. So I'm pretty positive we would have known if there were others. Their shadows disappear for a while but I'm still looking toward that direction. That's when I saw the weirdest figure, hunched over, walking in the most awkward way. The way its body moved was swift and unnatural. It was the same direction where I saw the people. We drove over to that direction, found nothing and left. We get home and we notice the car scratched up everywhere, like a coyote was going crazy on top of the car. The scratches were long and dragged, in different directions, and a few dirt paw prints all over the car. We had a car wash the next day, 
and the car was completely untouched before, and I'm pretty sure of that. We also left a McFlurry in the trunk of the car, which was untouched and not moved. If Coyotes got on the car, it definitely would have been destroyed, considered how dramatic the scratches were. So yeah, I'm wondering if what we saw were skimwalkers. The graveyard is also near reservation, and it seemed like a lot of Arizona pioneers and natives were buried there. Back about 10 years or so ago, my good friend and I would occasionally take trips to her family's property out in the middle of nowhere. It was fairly remote. You'd had to drive up a dirt road a few miles and couldn't access it unless you had a key to the chain on the gate. There wasn't anyone around for miles. All that was there was a trailer they had towed up and left to sleep in. The feel out there was always a little off. One day, we were wandering around the property, not really thinking of much until about 20 minutes later when we realized we had actually been walking out into the middle of nowhere. We had no water with us and had no clue where we were. Luckily, we found our way back after a while, but neither of us could explain why we did that. I'd also take my voice recorder, and we caught a, quite a few strange things on it. One day, before heading out there, we were talking about Skimwalker Ranch. It was only about a 40-minute drive from the property, so we thought, hey, why don't we go try to find it? We thought it would be cool to say that we had been there. After searching the internet, we found fairly good directions there and headed out for the night. We had a bit of trouble locating it, but after a bit of driving around, we pulled into an area that was spot on from the descriptions we had read. We stepped out of the car, and the first thing we noticed was the mass amounts of bugs swarming us. Only a few short seconds later, we had huge dogs barking, growling, and running at us. We immediately jumped back in the car and took off. We ended up staying in the area for a little longer exploring. Later that night, back at her property, we were sitting around the fire talking. All of a sudden, we started hearing barking. It was rather startling and she immediately froze and said she had never heard barking in this area before. She isn't one to get scared easily so her uneasiness put me on the edge. Not too long after that, there was more barking. Very slowly, we were being surrounded by what I assumed were coyotes. We both tried yelling, jumping around and throwing rocks, but that didn't seem to do any good. Never seen coyotes act this way. We were terrified and had no clue what to do. Not really wanting to stick around and find out if they'd get any closer to us, we doused the fire and flipped on our flashlights. She grabbed my hand and we booked it back into the trailer. We were both shaking by the time we made it in and she locked the door. I don't think either of us slept that well. I heard a lot of weird sounds and felt the sense of dread the entire night. As soon as the sun started to rise, we decided to pack up and get out of there. We need their car and what we saw sent chills down my spine. On the driver's side car, window was a huge handprint made with mud. It was easily twice the size of our hands. We looked at each other and silently agreed that we need to get the hell out of there. I'm not saying it was a skimwalker, but neither of us had been able to explain it, and I've never been back. Never in my life could I predict something like this would ever happen to me. You're probably wondering if I experienced a traumatic event such as a mugging, home invasion, car accident, or probably that I received shocking news from my doctor that I have some sort of cancer. Honestly, I would have preferred any of those events compared to the horror that I recently faced. Before I go any further, understand that I'm not crazy, nor am I under the influence of any mind-altering drugs. No one around me believed anything that happened, nor what I saw that night. So my words are all I have, as I give my recollection within this story. Cindy was an extraordinary girl. Beautiful as a rose, and always kind-hearted since the day she moved in next door. 
We met when we were both kids, and she would often come visit me to play and hang out, or vice versa. Both my parents and hers would become close. The more Cindy and I's friendship grew, that was. By our mid-teens, we were officially a couple, a perfect match. After high school, we both went to different colleges, but our bond and love for each other was still strong despite the distance between us. Now, in our 20s, I was off at the job that I'd been desperately yearning for in Los Angeles. Since we lived in New Mexico, I obviously had to relocate. Although I had my own place, Cindy was still living with her parents at the time while working at a daycare. The last thing I wanted to do was disrupt her future career plans, but I loved her way too much to be away from her. So I asked her to come with me. Despite this being the first time she'd be away from her home and her parents, she willingly agreed. I decided to first take a trip out to California to meet my new boss and more importantly, find a new apartment within the city closer to work before I officially moved there. Both Cindy and I chose to make a vacation out of it in a road trip out west. We left early that morning, hoping to reach our destination within a couple of days. Everything had a joyous feel about it. We were both excited and overall happy about starting our new lives. The morning had soon turned to evening. As we crossed the state line into Arizona, it made our way through the more deserted and rural areas. It was nearing the end of the day, as dusk finally set in. We were the only people, or so it seemed, driving down the highway with the vast desert and darkness surrounding us. I could only see as far as my headlights would allow, when suddenly, a huge dog stepped onto the road. I swerved the car just in time to avoid hitting the animal before stopping. With the abrupt stop, I accidentally sprained my wrist against the steering wheel. However, that wasn't the odd thing about it. The dog, which caused us to steer off the road, calmly made its way in front of the car once more. Its eyes glared in the headlights that stared undisturbed at us. Both Cindy and I were lost for words as we could do nothing but stare back in utter surprise. This encounter lasted less than a minute before the dog bared its teeth in a low grumble before turning its back to us and darting off into the darkness. Needless to say, this was beyond the doubt the weirdest thing that I had experienced thus far. Rather than dwelling on the incident, I glanced over at Cindy to tell her that she'd have to drive the rest of the way as my wrist was aching from the sprain. We pulled into a gas station off the lonely highway to get the supplies and bandages to tie my wrist. Cindy went into the rest stop while I pumped the gas. As always waiting for Cindy to fill the tank, out of nowhere, I heard the faintest grumbling sound. A peer round but saw nothing, nothing but the dark that engulfed the desert. I peered into the rest stop to see Cindy now making a purchase from the attendant when the grumble started again. I quickly turned around, and out in the distance, not 50 feet away, I spotted the very same large dog. However, it took off not two seconds after it somehow realized I saw it. This was indeed freaky, considering we were at least two to three miles from any point in the highway in which this incident occurred. In no way could a dog cover that distance in such a short amount of time. I tried to convince myself that what I saw was just a mere coincidence, but eerie nonetheless. I ushered Cindy to hurry up, without raising concern, as I didn't want to freak her out. Seeing as it was already late and my wrist was aching with pain, I decided that we should just call it a day and hit the road again in the morning. There was a motel less than a mile away from the gas station of which we decided to bunk down for the night. With there being a few occupancies, we were able to get a reasonable sized room as I helped Cindy unload our luggage from the car, all the while still not mentioning the strange occurrence. As we settled in, I was able to scrounge up some ice from the motel's dispenser to try and decrease the swelling of my wrist. As I lay on the bed and tried to relax, Cindy kept rifling through her handbag in concern. As it so happened, she had forgotten her credit card back at the gas station. She was adamant about going back and getting it, as she was convinced that it might have slipped out of her purse as she rushed out of the store. She was a little worried and concerned so I opted to go back to the gas station and see if I could find it for her, but she chose to go herself as I was in no condition to drive. I tried to convince her that I was capable of driving regardless of my hand, 
but she insisted. I also offered to go with her, seeing as it was late and all the weird occurrences that had happened thus far, but my efforts were futile once more. The gas station was less than a mile away and visible from our motel, so I knew Cindy wouldn't be gone long. Finally, easing the pain in my wrist with some ice, I accidentally dozed off while watching TV. When I awoke, however, it was an hour later and Cindy had not returned yet nor called. I tried reaching her but it would continuously ring without an answer. After calling her a couple more times but to no avail, I went over to the front desk to check with the night manager as to whether he had seen Cindy since we checked in together. Apart from seeing her leave the parking lot an hour earlier, he assured me that he hadn't seen her return. My worry soon transitioned into fear. Although the manager offered to call the police, I told him that I'd check the gas station and see if I could find her there before we alert the authorities. Cell phone usage is not promoted around the vicinity of gas pumps, so there was a possible reason she wasn't answering. I chose to walk over to the station, since it was under a mile, which would approximately take me 15 to 20 minutes if I hurried. Reluctantly, I began to trek down the dark highway guiding my path with the use of my flashlights. I tried desperately to stay positive, conceiving every possible excuse in my mind as to why Cindy had been absent for so long. The further along I went, I came across tire marks on the road as if a car had veered off the highway. Using my flashlights, I followed the irregular tracks just a few feet ahead until it trailed off the road. As I shone my light out into the darkness, off the side where the tracks led, my worst fear suddenly materialized. I saw the tail end of my car, at least 30 feet off the road. I immediately ran up to see if Cindy was inside, God forbid, badly injured due to the accidents. As I came up to the driver's side of the car, it was evident that it was empty. I frantically looked around and yelled for Cindy a couple of times. As I circled the vehicle, I noticed the keys were still in the ignition. The front windshield was smashed, and the front tire was flat, but no signs of actual collision. The only other major damage to the car was a huge dent on the hood, as if someone had dropped an anvil on it. I scrambled to dial 911 on my phone, but for some strange reason, I chose to call Cindy one last time. As her phone kept ringing, I constantly was on the lookout for any cars passing by. I tried calling again but as I was frantically looking around, a faint light caught my attention at least 20 feet from the car. I hastily approached the object on the desert floor, and as the light in question came into recognition, I realized it was Cindy's phone which I had been calling. I dropped to my knees and picked it up thinking the worst as my eyes swept up the tears. In my brief moment of grief, I heard someone call my name further out in the distance. I stood back up and tried to listen closely as, this time, I heard my name called again. The voice became clear as whoever was saying it was becoming closer. Focusing my eyes, I could see a figure in the distance closing in. I called out to it, but when the reply came I realized it was Cindy's voice. I bolted toward her feeling a sigh of relief. I pointed my flashlight at the figure and began to slow my pace, noticing Cindy walking toward me in a weird way. One of her legs was dragging as she propelled herself with the other, whilst one of her arms was waving at me, in a kind of strange manner. At first, I thought she was hurt from the accident, but the closer I got, the more fearful I became. Something didn't seem right about her, as I stopped in my tracks and watched as she extended her arm toward me and began tilting her head from side to side. Well, whatever this thing, only feet away from me was, as sure as hell was it my girlfriend. The being that appeared as Cindy kept calling my name as it moved in closer and closer. Its body began contorting in weird positions as trying to act more human. That didn't catch my attention more so than whatever it was. It also wore Cindy's clothes it looked like, except they were inside out. I slowly began to back away keeping my light on it. I can only speculate that it somehow became aware that I realized it wasn't who it was pretending to be as its eyes glared a bright red and the grumbling sound of a wild dog escaped its mouth. The gas station wasn't too far up the highway, 
but if I were to make it, I'd have to run like hell. Before I could even plan my escape, the thing dropped to the ground on all fours, as its body began to contort more rapidly, and I even heard its limbs snap. I took that as my cue to run. The moment as I back onto the highway, I bolted toward the gas station in full speed. I could hear the creature give off a blood-curdling cry from where I left it. A cry between that of a woman's scream and the howl of a wolf. I ran as fast as my feet would carry me, all whilst the cries echoed in the dark. For a moment, I could hear the faint panting of a wild dog giving chase almost parallel to the road alongside me. Whether it was chasing me or not, I was just a few short feet away from the gas station. There were no cars at any of the pumps as I hurried into the gas station store so frantically that I tripped onto the floor the moment I burst through the doors. The attendee rushed over to me to see if I was alright, but I was more focused on where that creature had followed. It glared at the outside and its surroundings as I stood to my feet drenched in sweat and breathing heavily. The attendee kept trying to get my attention and asking me if everything was okay, but I didn't even acknowledge him until I realized that there was no sign of that thing anywhere. I stepped outside briefly only to hear the still silence and the occasional rustling of the desert wind. Finally, directing my attention to the gas station attendee, I immediately asked him as to whether he had seen my girlfriend return. I tried explaining that she was missing as well as being chased by some weird creature on my way here. He asked her name, but when I told him, he froze for a moment then reached behind the counter drawer and pulled out Cindy's credit card. The same card she was supposed to return for after he handed it to me. The realization that something horrible had happened to my girlfriend settled in. I ushered him to call the police, whom arrived at the gas station about 15 minutes later. I recounted everything that happened to the police except for my encounter with whatever that creature was. How could I possibly explain what I saw and not be thought of as a mental case? Oh, shaken to my core, but had to remain sane for the sake of finding the real Cindy. I led the police to the side of the car rack in the motel where the rest of Cindy's belongings were. The cops launched a full search and investigation of the sudden disappearance while I was taken in for questioning that very night as being labeled the only suspect. Video surveillance at both locations revealed the time when Cindy left the motel, but never arrived at the gas station. Since I refused to recount my encounter with the fake Cindy, all fingers pointed towards me as the primary suspect. Though, I was ultimately released from the precinct, due to lack of compelling evidence that implicated me with her disappearance. I still felt like the guilty one though. Had I stopped her from leaving the motel room that night, Cindy would still be here. After some time, the search officially concluded, and Cindy's name was added to the state's list of missing persons. Her parents? still cling to the hope that their daughter is missing rather than dead, even months after the incident. Here in Canada, I have in-laws way up north in a place called the Northwest Territories. They're native and have a lot of weird tales from their community. They have family spread all over the north, a lot of them whom are in Alberta as well and will play into the story. So, it was a typical winter night, maybe 10-ish years ago at my in-law's grandparents' house. Not that late or anything, but very dark due to that time of year, and it was way too cold to be outside. At least negative 45 Celsius, or negative 49 degrees. Everyone was just sat hanging out and watching TV. Kids were playing in a typical average kind of night, you know? Suddenly, there is knocking at the door. Hard, persistent knocking. This was immediately strange as they live away, outside of any town, with kilometers between neighbors, and unannounced guests are almost unheard of. Their grandparents are visibly concerned and tell them not to answer the door. The knocking became harder, and the guests began to speak, loudly stating that they were auntie so-and-so, and that they had been invited over, the kids wanted to answer the door to see their auntie. Apparently, it sounded exactly like her. So their grandpa had to block the kids from going near the door and tell them to get away from the door and the windows as well. The knocking became known to pounding 
and the guest started yelling and screaming angrily to be let in. Eventually, it stopped and the guest was gone. The next morning, there were no tracks outside in the snow, and no signs of a vehicle had been in the area. This auntie lived in Alberta, had made no plans to visit. Anyway, that's about it. Not much for excitement but that kind of shit is weirdly common out here in some places. Believe it or not, Wendigo is a major piece of folklore in that family as well, and they refuse to talk about it out of fear of drawing one in.